that's all. Okay. Yes. All right. I can start. Thank you. Okay. All right. So um, after this uh, rather general uh, uh, discussion about um, sort of uh, Monte Carlo methods, uh, so let's talk about uh, nuclear collisions and um, sort of the bad news first. Um, well, maybe it's also good news because uh, we still have jobs, but there is really no comprehensive fully uh, you know qcd based theory for heavy ion collisions and uh, um, you know it's of course a complicated topic so you know if you want to write down an amplitude for you know these processes that we investigated would be something like nucleus one and two in an initial state and then you know qcd does its thing and then there's some kind of final state and uh, that's of course um, uh, a very uh, tall order for several reasons, some of which I already um, indicated, uh, simply lack of um, um, control on the experimental side, but also um, really, um, in addition, there is, um, um, we have not fully solved QCD, right? So uh, what do we do? Well, so progress has been made by looking at different aspects of collision, right? People looking at hard probes, people looking at heavy quarks and their dynamics, people looking at uh, bulk and fluid dynamics and things like that. And uh, um, a lot of these have been very successful. Um, some of them are more rigorous than others. Uh, for some aspects, we only have models, like for hadronization. Uh, so we'll get to uh, quite a few, um, at least on the surface, uh, in the next uh, uh, 20 or 30 minutes. So. Jetscape is really a tool that um, tries to pull together some of these different aspects of nuclear collisions and some of these um, solutions and models that are already out there. So here's a flow diagram that probably was shown yesterday already. Um, and I'll just um, put it here as a teaser because I will get back to that. So there's quite a few, um, quite a few elements in there, quite a few modules. And the biggest separation here is really the one between bulk, which is sort of um, everything at the bottom, and uh, everything that sort of has to do with hard probes, which is sort of the, the top part here, okay? And there's sort of a good reason for this, right? So um, our energies are large enough that certainly we have to deal with partonic degrees of freedom. So um, if you're gonna go to partons, you probably wanna, um, sort of starting from this amplitude that I had written down in the previous slide, you want to go to sort of wave functions, parton wave functions in these nuclei, so something like this, where the partons have different momenta and spins and colors. And the separation between bulk and, uh, and hard probes really comes from the longitudinal momenta of these uh, partons, if one, if one traces it back, right? So um, if the longitudinal momentum of a parton is PZ, and I take this ratio with the, uh, with the momentum of the nucleon in, in which it is. So this is often called Burkin X, um, or it's one variant of, of, of Burkin X. Then I can sort of look at the following um, possibilities, right? So if I have two large X partons, so partons with a lot of energy that collide, uh, two quarks and two gluons. Um, so those are um, binary collisions, mostly binary collisions that produce um, high transverse momentum or can potentially produce high transverse momentum uh, partons so that those can become jets. Um, now these are relatively rare uh, compared to um, the overall incidence of these uh, of these collisions in particular if you go to very high uh, energetic hard probes. Uh, so you need always basically PTs of a few GV which means the original PC also needs to be of that order. Now you can have large X and small X, which is actually not very interesting because it means the large X, part, large X parton will probably continue to go along basically undisturbed. So you will get something in the forward and backward directions, which is uh, not very interesting, um, but um, some people look at this in the context of colored glass as well. Um, and then you have sort of small X on small X, right? And uh, so those are then soft interactions. There's certainly no, P, no PQCD. And this is where we think um, this part of the system sort of um, thermalizes, at least gets close to thermal equilibrium. Uh, and that's what makes up the bulk. And uh, that's what becomes a coagulone plasma. So um, 
there's one aspect which um, in sort of the spinary uh, in the spinary picture um, is a little bit uh, 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 not not taken into account, uh, and that's that the low x, low x partons are of course plentiful, right? So large x partons are few, low x partons are plentiful. So uh, whenever there are small x partons involved, it typically is is multiple scattering, and indeed. Uh, an effective picture of this, like color glass condensate, uh, does take that into account. So multiple scattering is always uh, included um, in a uh, picture um, that, that makes sense for this regime. Um, so, well, Jetscape has a bulk physics component, and that really goes with this uh, part of this, uh, you know, admittedly rather crude picture. And Jetscape has a um, a hard process um, component, which comes uh, or goes with this part here. So, of course, these different regimes will interact, right? So that's what jet cringing is about. So you produce jets, but then they somehow, after the initial interactions, they still continue to interact with what is around. Uh, they interact with, with gluon plasma, they interact probably with the hadronic um, phase that is there after uh, after the phase transition. However, if you look at the final state, you see that those domains are actually still there, right? And that's why it really makes sense to divide it up this way. So there's sort of always um, this part in the data where bulk physics works, where our hydro calculations, or hydro plus um, hadronic cascade calculations work very well. And then there's the part where uh, clearly it is jet physics. And uh, we have to do PQCD and uh, and uh, all the related uh, techniques. Um, there is a uh, no man's land, which has on on various occasions already been described as a no man's land, and that's where probably neither of those two descriptions alone is sufficient. When we're really when the actions are between the um, those two regimes are large enough to uh, uh, to have uh, an effect, so that it's not clearly any one of those two other two regimes anymore. Okay. All right. So, with that out of the way, let's uh, focus on the hard uh, process domain for a little while. So, um, the important the, there's there's two important parts here that make this tractable. For one, momentum transfers are large, so the strong coupling becomes weak, so we can apply perturbative QCD. Um, that's great, just that, of course, there's always this long distance behavior in QCD as well, which you can never escape, right? So if you have to do um, integrals in Feynman diagrams, there's always um, a, um, an infrared limit uh, that you need to uh, worry about. There's soft gluons that could be around. So this is where factorization theorems come in. And these factorization theorems generally uh, where, where they're applicable, separate sort of uh, long distance behavior uh, off into universal functions that can be measured uh, and separates them off from the PQCD matrix elements that you can calculate separately. Um, so one example is um, inclusive hadron production uh, in hadron-hadron collisions like PP. Uh, so here is um, uh, basically the sketch how this works. Um, at leading twist, uh, leading twist means there are actually corrections to this picture that will then lead down the rabbit hole. Uh, but the leading contribution should be this. So basically, out of your hadron number one, and you can you can later on also think of this as nucleus nucleus because we will apply this picture in some way also to nucleus nucleus collisions. But let, let me stick with hadron hadron or proton proton for now. So you, um, if you have um, these two hadrons. Uh, the leading picture is that you take one part on each from uh, these hadrons. Uh, they are labeled uh, small a and small b here. And those partons then have a perturbative scattering. So there's a matrix element that's basically the, or a cross section, that's the, uh, the gray box here. And uh, that one you can calculate in perturbative QCD. The, the process of taking these partons out of the, uh, the hadron is something that involves obviously uh, long, long distance behavior long, um, in, in QCD because uh, it involves a bound state. And this is, can be described by a part of distribution function, which is a non-perturbative object 
that is universal and can then be, um, for example, measured in one process and transferred to another process. And then um, this uh, perturbative process spits out some partons, and one of these partons, called C here, then will eventually form the hadron that we want to form. And this can be described by this fragmentation function, D. So one can write down a formula for this. So basically, the hadronic cross-section here, so AB goes to C, um, is um, a, a convolution, which means you have to integrate over the momentum fractions of these partons inside their respective hadrons. Um, so this is, uh, indicates a convolution, and it's a convolution of uh, the parton distribution function of parton A, parton distribution function of parton B. Um, here is the PQCD cross-section that you can calculate perturbatively, and then here is the fragmentation function. Uh, so both the PDF and the fragmentation function are universal objects. So, yeah, I already mentioned this. So this is what we call the leading twist contribution, which means in principle here, uh, in, in addition to this term here, I will have other terms which are suppressed then by powers of whatever the large scale here is. Uh, let's call it Q divided by uh, lambda QCD, some power of that. Um, so these factorization theorems have been uh, shown. Uh, there was a big program in the 80s and 90s uh, for a lot of processes. Um, people are still working on this, of course. Um, and uh, they were shown for inclusive processes, which means we're basically you're not interested in anything else. You're interested in one thing only, in this case, in this, in this Hadron C. And it's increasingly more difficult to um, um, uh, to, uh, to factorize when you're more exclusive. Now, Monte Carlos are completely exclusive. You keep track of every particle there is, right? You, you don't throw anything really away until you form your final observables, maybe, in the end. And um, so um, there's a little bit of a leap of faith here, but um, uh, Monte Carlos have to uh, rely on these uh, factorizations. Um, otherwise, it would be a... a yeah, uh, basically a very steep climb. And um, so, well, what they do is they sample, they take part of distribution functions, they sample part of distribution functions, um, they take them these partonic cross sections and so on and so on. Aida? Aida? Yes. Yeah. There is a question on the Slack channel, or two related questions. One is, are there any specific values for PT to separate regions like bulk physics, no man's land, and jet physics, and related to this, do we have a definition of large and small x? So x yeah. being larger than or smaller okay. than some number. So as other, okay. otherwise, there are questions about the scale. How, how, how does the scale separation go? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, right, so the question is where are these uh, boundaries here, right? And uh, um, I would say, so this is uh, empirical uh, in, in certain ways. Um, so if you, uh, if you take your hydrodynamic calculations or your hydro plus cascade calculations, and uh, they can comfortably describe uh, the data at low momenta, maybe up to one and a half or two GV, uh, but then you start to have trouble. So that's basically where we have to say, um, um, th this is where we have to stop, right? Um, so we can certainly make predictions further up in, in PT, and by including viscous corrections, you can go further up in, in momentum. But I would say something around 2 GV here is certainly um, something where you would have to stop for the, for the, for the bulk, okay, where it, where it becomes dicey. Um, the boundary here is, um, um, you, you, can, you can probably think about uh, that it has to be higher than this point here where um, the, the behavior of the, uh, this is REA here, uh, turns around and come and, and, and uh, sort of changes from this fall here to this, to this rise, uh, it cannot really be uh, earlier than that. So typically this uh, is around five, six, seven GV here. So somewhere between, I would say six and 10 GV is where, you know, once you're beyond 10 GV, you're probably relatively okay with jet physics, um, but below 10 GV, uh, one has to certainly uh, worry about uh, uh, contributions where this um, strict separation um, 
doesn't make make fully sense anymore and cannot describe all the aspects. Okay. Um, okay. So and then of course you can relate these to uh, values of of x roughly, right? By uh, by asking if say if this were just a binary um, a binary scattering, what is that um, that value of x that you would need? Uh, just looking at um, say um, you know energy conservation. So if you want to have if you want to have a 10 GV uh, a 10 GV parton that creates maybe something perturbative here uh, at 10 GV, uh, then this should also have uh, a longitudinal momentum of 10 GV, right? Giving 10 GV plus 10 GV, and then turning around and giving you 10 GV, 10 GV in the uh, transverse in the transverse uh, direction. So that divided by one half squared s, that will be the values of x. And then, uh, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Okay, I'll move on. Okay. All right, yeah, so I think um, I wanted to move on to part and distribution functions, uh, just to um, give an impression that, um, you know, er everything is rigorously defined here, even though they are non perturbative functions. So, in fact, say a quark distribution function is what you would assume it is, it, uh, you know, it, it sort of counts um, the quark, so there is a quark field here between um, states of, between hadron states, okay? Um, there's just a Fourier transformation here to make this uh, 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 function of the momentum fraction. Um, and here's the same for the gluon. So um, again, parton distribution functions give you the probability to find a parton, a given parton inside a hadron with a given momentum fraction, which should be between zero and one. Now, because they are universal, you can parameterize them. You can use um, um, e plus in my, uh, sorry, um, uh, deep elastic scattering data, so EP. Uh, you can use Drelian. You can use, um, uh, there's a lot of data now from PP uh, that has been used, jets and um, top quarks and, and other things to, uh, uh, to constrain these uh, PDFs. And again, the um, the way you can do it is that if you, if this is the only non-perturbative input, then you have some perturbative input, which are these uh, uh, these uh, part of these parton uh, parton cross sections, uh, and then you have some final state which you actually measure. Then you can sort of go and extract the um, uh, the parton distribution functions. And there's an entire uh, machinery behind this. So CTEC, for example, is one of the uh, collaborations that does that, and you can see uh, PDFs here for two um, for two different scales, uh, two GV and one hundred GV. So, uh, what about those scales? Before I um, uh, briefly discuss this, let me just point out that there is a difference between parton distribution functions of free protons and neutrons and parton distributions in in nuclei, and uh, we have to be aware of that. And um, uh, there are parameterizations for um, nuclear PDFs out there, which you can, which you can find. So uh, what about those uh, scale dependence? So there are radiative corrections. So PDFs would only be really monolithic um, in a uh, simple sort of parton, uh, parton model picture. But in QCD, when you have radiative corrections, um, they start to um, depend on, on this uh, scale. Uh, which now here is called Q in the in the plot here previously. Sorry, uh, since it's not my plot, uh, here it was called Q. But um, so um, they they depend on the scale, and um, the um, the dependence is determined by this uh, Dieckhoff equation. Doctor, it's a group of Lipatov, Altarelli, Parisi, um, uh, and uh, so. Basically, the input here, uh, the kernel that you see here is what is called a splitting function. So uh, the picture here is that um, um, as, the, uh, as the, uh, the scale changes, there are, uh, there's a gluon radiation. So a splitting of, say, uh, a, a quark goes into a quark plus a gluon, or um, a gluon splits into two gluons. Uh, and, um, and those are given by these splitting functions. Now, fragmentation functions have a very similar behavior, um, and later on we'll talk about fragmentation functions um, a bit more. Um, so, we can already sort of put together part of what, uh, 
Jetscape is actually doing. So we have PDFs now, and we have um, sort of these hard cross sections, perturbative cross sections between partons. And um, you have um, these PDFs measured, you have the cross sections uh, calculated as distributions, and now you can sample them. And um, you can add, if you want, initial state radiation and maybe additional parton uh, interactions beyond the simple binary. And that's already a good part of what um, modern event generator needs to do, at least um, in, in the vacuum for these, um, or in, even in, in AA for um, this hard sector. So Jetscape uh, uses Pythia 8 as the default for, for these tasks. Okay. Um, you might ask about spatial information. Um, so in AA collisions, that is of course important. So where are jets created inside a, um, a nucleus nucleus collision? And uh, one can gain information on that by sampling, um, say, the binary collisions in a global in a global model or something like that. Okay, so there is some information available for that. Now, what about the sort of the final state part? Now, um, fragmentation functions, um, as I introduced them before, are actually not very much used because they're sort of too inclusive, uh, indeed, and they don't give you enough information. So rather, what is done is you um, in these um, event generators, you model fragmentation functions or describe fragmentation functions as a parton shower, an explicit shower where uh, these partons split, uh, just as in the DGLAB equation, and then hadronization. So again, one part is sort of um, sort of rigorous, um, guided by perturbative QCD. Hadronization here, this is where the really non-perturbative part um, uh, sits. Okay. So Monte Carlo event generators usually start this process um, with the partons that emerge from the hard process. So that's where we are sort of uh, where we are right now. And using the DGAP equations, then you can evolve these partons from large virtualities to small virtualities, right? So in principle, all of this is of course a, a quantum process. There's uh, partons that are scattering and uh, they will have final state radiation. Um, you're sort of cutting um, cutting a leg here, uh, not a leg, but we're, we're cutting a line in a Feynman diagram here. So typically this will be off shell and it will have some virtuality. So we pick up this virtuality and now the shell Monte Carlo adds that final state radiation. And we'll then typically roll from the largest virtuality to the from large virtuality to small virtuality, and there will be a cutoff um, uh, that determines how low you want to go in virtuality. Uh, something close to a um, uh, non perturbative scale, but not quite, say 1 GV uh, is, is typically the default in, in Pythia. And then you still have to hadronize, and we'll talk about that in, in, in just a little bit. So, how is this done um, in detail? In fact, um, it's, there's ambiguities and there's differences between how this is done in Pythia and in others. So um, this here is um, um, more close to what, um, what, what Matter is doing. So you start with some uh, maximum allowed virtuality, which is basically given by the hard process, okay? Um, and then you have to sort of, again, Monte Carlo, uh, Monte Carlo the, the process of these, um, of, of these gluon, gluons being radiated. So, um, okay, we have an initial one. So now let's do a step. Say we have given a virtuality and we want to go and see, is there a, uh, a radiation at a slightly lower virtuality? Uh, let's call those QI and then QI plus one because it's a, a, an iterative process. And uh, basically, the probability for that is the probability for not having any splitting, so no radiation between QI and QI plus one, um, which is also sometimes called the Sudica form factor. And you can actually just uh, get this from um, the, the DCLEF, the, uh, um, the splitting functions by exponentiation. And then the actual probability that there is a split going to split at, at, at QI plus one. So that's what you have to sample in this case. And uh, that way you work your way down uh, this ladder <clears throat> from uh, large virtualities to small virtualities. And you should end up with, uh, with partons then that have small virtualities, maybe something around 1 GV, but that's typically something you can set in your Shao Monte Carlo. Uh, 
Yes. There's a question about what means large virtuality here and what is small virtuality. Okay, yeah, very good. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so it's, it, it is weak because there are no, um, uh, I didn't really put in numbers, but so the, uh, the virtuality will be the, of, the, of the order of the, uh, uh, the momentum transfer in the process, right, in the hard process. Um, so, um, in reality, in, in, in matter, for example, it is a parameter of basically the momentum, initial momentum of the parton. Uh, so it's the, um, uh, a, a, uh, so it's a function of the initial momentum of the, uh, of the parton, uh, the jet initiating parton, but um, the exact relationship can actually be adjusted um, to data. And for example, in our PP19 tune, uh, there's a, a choice made, but say um, you have 100 GV, um, 100 GV parton that is created, then it will be of that order, the initial virtuality, okay? And then small virtuality, again, um, so you want to stop before you completely go into the non-perturbative domain, uh, at least in the vacuum, so something like 1 GV uh, seems um, a, good, um, a good choice. Uh, in the medium, it might actually be, um, you might, make a different choice here and maybe choose something slightly larger because uh, you will have partons that if they're still inside the QGP, still will interact with the QGP and can actually remain, um, retain some, some virtuality, okay? But if you think uh, um, really large, um, for, for largest virtuality, um, something of the order of say the jet energy, if it's a parton that initiates a jet and uh, the smallest virtuality, something like one GV, that's a good ballpark. Okay, um, yes, okay, so um, I wanted to, so everything on the previous slide was basically um, a vacuum, right? But of course, we are really interested in the medium uh, and parton showers in the medium are modified and that's really what it's about. Um, now, the uh, virtuality driven shower like matter will have modifications and uh, there is um, in, in specifically in matter, these are based on what is called the higher twist formalism, because indeed sort of um, other interactions in the final state you can sort of describe as higher twists. So there's these power, these power corrections, uh, which can become large in nucleus-nucleus uh, collisions. And matter is sort of the standard parton shower for, for final state parton showers um, in, in Jetscape. But then as I already um, uh, indicated when I answered the question, um, you can end up with a situation now where this virtuality uh, has become very low, say one GV um, or close by, but the energy of the parton is still large. Maybe it's still a 20 GV energy parton inside the QGP. So then you have to switch to parton transport. Um, that's at least the default picture in, uh, in Jetscape. And you end up with a picture like this. So um, you recognize again from the previous slide, the hard process and the parton shower. And now each of these partons, if it is still in the QGP, uh, and if, it's, if it's, it has still sufficient energy, so that it's not just being absorbed by the QGP, will um, um, propagate through the medium and there can be additional induced radiation, there can be elastic scatterings. And um, the um, LBT and Martini are two modules in in Jetscape that can deal with that. In fact, these little blobs that are put here to indicate the fate of these partons, they are from, uh, from, LBT, uh, from LBT presentations. So that's the, uh, the picture that they give. So um, you notice here that in addition to the virtuality, now I also uh, say something about the energy. So as these uh, partons split here in the shower, of course, um, the energy sort of goes down, but very often there's still a leading a leading energy, uh, a leading parton that has quite a lot of energy. And even in the medium, um, if you look at a typical matter shower, um, there's no, there, there's not much additional energy loss. So the energies of these partons can still be pretty large at the end of the, of this virtuality driven shower. Um, so they're smaller, but they could possibly be much larger than T. And this is the domain where LBT or Martini or if you prefer, there's also a strong coupling module uh, called hybrid um, that you can use, uh, excuse me, um, that can take care of these partons until they have propagated outside of the medium. 
Okay, so um, there was a dedicated talk by uh, Goiko on Friday. Um, is it Friday? I believe it is Friday. Uh, and hopefully he will have much more to, uh, to say about this. All right. Um, let's see what's going on. Okay, so uh, briefly about hadronization. Um, there are sort of uh, three models that have been floating around, actually sort of two models that have been floating around in event generators for quite a while. Um, the Lone String Fragmentation Model um, that uh, probably everybody has heard about, where basically you form strings. Uh, this is based on the idea that if you pull apart quarks in the vacuum, so if you're, if you're uh, above a certain distance, um, you no longer have a Coulomb-like potential, but you have the string-like potential. And this sort of codified by this lone string fragmentation model where you have then these strings between the partons. Um, typically, the typical string is between, say, a quark and an antiquark, and you can have gluons, which act as, um, um, that sort of sit between the two um, endpoints and add energy. Um, they're also sometimes called kinks on the string. Um, and then there's tunneling processes uh, through which these strings actually decay into hadrons. Uh, the other one is cluster hadronization, but since we're not really using it, uh, I'm not really, um, I don't want to talk about it. Um, the, well, the, the, the once new kid on the block, um, uh, sort of at the beginning of the RIC era was quark recombination, where um, the basic idea is you just, um, if you start out with a bunch of quarks um, in phase space, you just, um, uh, calculate the overlap with hadron wave functions um, and determine um, quarks that directly form uh, form hadrons uh, through that. And um, there's quite a few observations, actually, interestingly, a lot of them in this no man's land uh, that can be quite conveniently explained by quark recombination. So in Jetscape, um, there's actually uh, two different variants of the Lund string fragmentation. I should actually say the Lund strings are really the same, but the way they are formed. Uh, are different. Uh, they're called colored and colorless. Um, you can check that out. Um, and then there's also a hybrid hadronization, which is rather new, which uh, is sort of, well, it's a hybrid between um, the first two models here. So it interpolates between um, string fragmentation in dilute systems and recombination in dense systems. And uh, so this is something that hopefully will help us with, for example, um, going a little bit further down into this no man's land where obviously interactions between the bulk and um, and the jet partons in hadronization uh, play a big role. Um, so because what you can have, for example, is that some of these partons that you recombine here are uh, part of a, a jet shower and others are thermal. And then you get additional interactions at hadronization. All right, so Aina, physics, I Aina think, can uh, we wrap up? The hour yes, is over. yes, um, okay. very good. Um, I'm actually, yeah, I will, um, I will not say much about bulk physics because I know there are um, talks about that as well. Um, so let me just um, point out that there's sort of the standard model for the bulk of AA collisions, um, sort of the initial phase, which in in Jetscape is handled by Trento, which is more like an initial state parameterization which is then propagated to some initial time for the hydro. And then there's viscous fluid dynamics and um, antihydronic transport, which, uh, uh, for which Jetscape really has state-of-the-art simulations available, namely music and smash and um, other hydro codes um, are going to be available as well. Uh, so I skipped the details for the, for the hydro and just um, refer to the talks by Chun and uh, uh, Yasuki. Uh, Yasuki will specifically tell us about, um, I believe, about the back reaction also from jets or hard probes onto the bulk, which is a new frontier. And for SMASH, um, there will be a talk by Dmitry Olyichenko. Okay, so um, yeah, let me skip over this too. So, so let me just summarize. Now, um, I hope, <laughs> um, I don't know if I succeeded, but I hope that it's now easier to sort of follow through the Jetscape flowchart, right? Um, so let me do this for the, for the bulk first. The bulk, as I said, was at the bottom. So we have some, uh, now it's the part that I sort of skipped, but um, we have some initial, uh, initial state, which is um, basically Trento, maybe with some free streaming. Then we have viscous fluid dynamics. We have a hydronic cascade. 
and then we can uh, freeze out and directly um, look at observables. Um, now, there is um, a, a paper in preparation where um, there is a lot of work done. And uh, so this will provide a very nice tuned background for hard probe studies in the future. And I think that's one of the strengths of, uh, of Jetscape. You can, of course, can run the soft part by yourself as well. But um, there will also be something standardized available at some point uh, that the community can use. Um, the hard probes, um, I just wanted to point out for the vacuum, uh, only some of these modules are used, in particular the um, high energy, high virtuality shower, that is matter. Um, and of course the PDFs and the hard process that we talked about and then hadronization, in this case, uh, um, mostly string fragmentation. And there is already a tune out for PP, um, hard physics called the PP19 tune. Um, and a paper that is on the archive uh, in which um, uh, we've, um, did a, we did a lot of comparisons of um, Jetscape with both Pythia 8 and, and data. And then uh, lastly, of course, um, hard probes in AA where you have sort of the full gamut of things. So you have not just matter, but you can have uh, high energy low Q showers, which are um, LBT and martini, and you can have also low energy, uh, low energy um, uh, modeling, uh, or, which is basically the strong coupling uh, module hybrid. And you can have recrimination here. And there's lots of results, of course, forthcoming uh, from that too. Okay, so that's actually all I have. And um, yeah, I'm ready to take more questions. So I, Cannot actually see Slack, but I can. Yeah, um, let me. I, I can stop my presentation and go to Slack. But um, I, I, I will read some yeah. to you, which I sort of. Okay. Uh, so one question was in simulations: How do do we know which particle to produce from hydro data? E.g., how how to know whether to make a, to form a kaon or a proton? Ah, okay. Oh yeah, very good. Um, very good. So so um, th there is uh, there is of course more than that. Um, Okay, yeah, if I go back actually to the thermal sampling. So I, I focused on the, on the, on the, on the um, uh, sampling the momentum of the thermal distribution. Um, but there's of course more to that. You also have to get the, the particle ratios correct, right? So you can, always, uh, you can always calculate what is sort of the totally expected, um, let me go back. You can, al you can always, um, calculate what is sort of the totally expected number of say pions and kaons and protons. And then what, um, uh, what you get are constraints on, 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 the, on the sampling. Uh, so you get, uh, you, get, uh, you get constraints and uh, there's nice papers say by, uh, for example, about Pazi and uh, Pazi Hulvinen and, um, and uh, Hanna uh, Elfner and so on, uh, where this is um, all described uh, nicely. Um, and others, um, I don't want to shortchange anybody. Uh, but um, so uh, bottom line is um, you, you have to calculate what the total number of particles is, right? So this was sort of missing in, in uh, this calculation here. So, and you have to take that into account and you have to take that into account for each individual species. And then you have to make sure, okay, so here, and then you have to make sure that, um, you know, you're not, uh, producing too many positive particles versus negative particles and things like that. So um, there's, in, there's quite some, some details that you need to be uh, careful about, right? But the bottom line is you can calculate, if you, cal if you sum over all of these cells, you have an expectation val value for how many of these uh, particles you should get. All right, very good. So one more question on the slide 20, uh, 18. What is a leading quiz contribution? Yeah. No. Okay, sorry. It's a little bit slow. There we go. Okay, so um, so it turns out that what you can do is you can, so you have basically two scales here. You have a large scale, uh, which is basically your momentum transfer, or you know, if you have something like the hadron pr hadron production, it's basically the the momentum of your hadron, and then you always have lambda QCD, um, and uh, so they enter, for example, logarithmically in uh, things like the coupling constant. But 
uh, you can have, um, there's actually power, there's actually uh, power, con power um, uh, corrections to this formula here. Uh, so that really go like powers of Q over lambda. Um, so they could be, for example, so this is, the leading twist is really basically like the old uh, Parton model where you have uh, no QCD corrections, right? So then you can add QCD corrections to the cross section here. But what, for example, if you, um, instead of taking one part on A from the first hadron, you take two um, and, and somehow make a, uh, let that, those two interact with, the, uh, with B, right? So you take A and A1 and A2 from, from the first hadron and B from the other one. So um, this would be some kind of multiple scattering and that, that would generally give you, for example, a higher twist contribution, okay? So indeed, um, when I talked about the higher twist formalism that is behind matter, uh, they are calculating these kind of diagrams. So if you go to these papers by Wang and Guo from uh, the early 2000s, for example, um, they, they look at these uh, additional scatterings in the final state uh, that you can get. And uh, those are higher twist. Okay, as far as I can see, all the other questions got thankfully uh, uh, answered by the other students, which is very nice. So I suggest if there is one more pressing question, please raise your hand in, uh, in Zoom. Otherwise, I don't see any questions which have not been addressed on the Slack channel. And of course, Rainer, you can also go back and see. I will, add yeah, I will go back to Slack after uh, I start yeah. the screen sharing. But that you can do offline. So if there are no yeah. more questions and I don't see anything on the Zoom, I hand it over to Lauren, since he's the master of the ceremony, and I shut up. Okay. Sorry for running over time. Thanks, Reiner, for your presentation. Um, do we want to take a short break or just continue? I think maybe we should just continue since we're over time.